All right. So um, I'm going to talk about a subject I wouldn't have talked about six months ago, but uh, that has taken a lot of uh, importance in my mind and uh, my emotions because it's scary. Um, and I don't think we are on a good trajectory in terms of the whole society. Um, and I'll try to explain why. Um, I want to really tell you a lot about solutions uh, besides government intervention. Um, but but I think that's a, a, you know another discussion uh, for which we need many more minds to uh, get into thinking how we can benefit from AI, but but for sure avoid uh, catastrophic outcomes. So um, let me, um, I'm going to spend some time explaining some issues in AI safety. Um, let's start with just a very simple notion, which is, is that technology in general is dual use. It could be used for good. It could be used by uh, individuals or organizations in, in ways that would harm uh, others. And What's special about uh, technology in general, but AI in particular, is that it's getting more powerful. And the more powerful a technology is, the more it can be beneficial, but also the more it can be uh, harmful. And so I think we, you know, whereas before chat GPT, I didn't pay much attention to the potential harms. I mean, I did pay attention to things like uh, uh, discrimination and human rights issues, but but I didn't think it would like destroy our society, and uh, and now I'm not so sure, uh, because we are building more and more powerful systems that can be used by bad actors or simply uh, used in, in 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 a way that lacks uh, precaution that and that may end up harm all of us. Um. Yeah, so I guess one of the big questions to which I don't have any answer is whether we are individually and collectively wise enough to handle such very powerful technologies. Um, and, and really the, the key starting point of all this is looking back on the progress of deep learning and, and AI in, in, in the last decades and years and just project yourself into where that goes. Um, I, I, you know, I and many others, including neuroscientists, think that the brain is just a very complicated machine, and we're making progress in um, capturing a lot of the abilities that brains have in terms of intelligence. We haven't, you know, we're not done yet, but we're getting pretty close. At least it looks like it, and so it's not unreasonable to think that we will reach the level of intelligence of humans in maybe a few years, maybe a few decades, no one really knows. But what happens when we get there? Um, is it possible that such powerful systems could harm us? In particular, uh, you have to think about these systems um, if they are agent. In other words, like you know, RL systems. Uh, and especially agents that are goal driven, where you can specify the goals, like you know, in Chat GPT, you can specify a query. So if you can separate intelligence from the goals to which that intelligence is applied, this is dangerous because you can just specify a goal that's harmful. So how do we avoid that? Um, uh, and the other really big concern I have is. You know, as these tools become more powerful, if they end up in the hands of a few people, there's a huge danger for, for democracy, for our economic system. Um, power concentration is exactly the opposite of democracy. Democracy means sharing power. But if, you know, it, we can easily imagine how AI could be used to concentrate power, for example, uh, against the people, the opposition, the political opposition, or people who don't agree with the government, um, or as a tool of economic dominance. And, you know, you end up with monopolies and we're, we're going in that direction. Um, or as a tool of military dominance. Um, and already a lot of military organizations are trying to develop 
weapons based on AI. And finally, the worst kind of nightmare um, is beyond these, which are already like very scary, is that we end up designing systems that are smarter than us. And even though we design them, we lose control of them. And, and I'll explain how that could happen and uh, how that you know opens a Pandora's box that we won't be able to close and on which we lose control over our future potentially. Right. So um, no laughable matter. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about um, alignment um, because it's it's a it's an important element of the question of uh, safety, um, but it actually it's broader than that. It pretty much all of the issues we have with AI and powerful technology um, are connected with uh, an alignment problem. So so what is what is alignment? It's it's a mismatch between intended and obtained behavior. This is a problem that's really well studied in economics. Uh, so imagine you have two uh, companies. Uh, company A wants to get some job done by company B. Company B says they can do it. And so company A drafts a contract uh, that specifies uh, what company B should be doing in order to get their reward. The problem that has been studied by economics uh, in economics, and, and there was a recent Nobel Prize for this, is that in general, it's impossible in a reasonably small contract to specify everything that company B should be doing. There's, it, there's always gonna be some corner cases, in fact, an exponentially large number of corner cases where A intended one thing and, and, and it's not specified. And so B is gonna try to, if it tries to maximize its reward, it's gonna try to uh, cheat. It's going to try to get the reward without doing what A intends. And of course, if you replace the two companies by so humans on one side and, and AI on the other side, you see that we also have a problem. Uh, and that problem grows as these AI systems get more powerful. So bias and discrimination is already an alignment problem because you know, the people who build the systems that are discriminating usually don't intend to obtain that discrimination, but that's what happens. Um, power concentration is, is a more subtle kind of misalignment, but it is between what society, at least in democratic countries, wants um, and what you get with uh, companies trying to dominate economically because they compete with each other. And of course, that that's something that's happening in the AI market. Um, Social and job market perturbations are similar. We, you know, people put out products and they don't necessarily have a good understanding or incentives to take care of potential side effects, quote unquote, on, on society, on the poorest people, on some particular slices of the job market. So there could be all kinds of unexpected social impact. Uh, people have been talking a lot about polarization due to social network, for example. So, um, Today, I, I'll actually talk about other alignment problems. Um, so uh, maybe the shorter term things that are already happening to some extent but could become worse is uh, deep fakes, misinformation, fraud using AI. Uh, and it's just going to get worse as these systems become more powerful. Um, there's also the concern about AI systems making it easier to build dangerous weapons like uh, you know cyber attacks. Um, bioweapons, chemical weapons. Um, the power concentration problem could get a lot worse if we build AIs that are really superhuman in significant ways, because the people will have who will control these systems could really become like, you know, semi-gods. Um, and of course, that's on a path to destroy democracy. It was as I was saying at the beginning. And and finally, there's the problem of uh mismatch between what humans in general want like, you know they, they want to be well and uh, cure disease and, and you know have food and, and, and feel good um and what machines we build might want okay might have as goals uh, and that's the problem of loss of control that i'll talk about if that happens um and we we you know 
we end up with machines that have a kind of self-preservation instinct for some reason, which we can discuss. Uh, it's like creating a new species. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that. And of course, that that's the that's that's the thing that is the worst nightmare in my case, uh, because we have the least handle on uh, you know solving the problem. Um, okay. Um, let, let, let me take, talk a little bit more about this uh, alignment problem, by which especially like maybe a small loophole can become a big thing. Um, again, think about the contract between society and companies where companies are allowed to make money so long as they do it legally. Um, and that kind of works in general, but, but you know, some company, companies find ways to maximize their profit and harm society, for example, by polluting. And, you know, they, they will also happily lie as, uh, say, uh, fossil fuels company lied about climate change or tobacco companies lied about the effect of tobacco. Um, so, so this is the problem of contracts, uh, really, that I talked about, that the, that the, the uh, principle that, you know, designs the, the, the law or the contract um, may have some intention, which you could think of like the spirit of the law. Um, but the, the, the agent, like the company uh, may um, actually just follow the letter of the law and still do something harmful. And the more powerful the agent is, like the larger the company, the more powerful it is, the more likely it is to find loopholes. You know, they hire really armies of lawyers that find the loopholes in the rules so that they can make more profit, uh, even though it's hurting society, like, like producing more pollution or taking risks with everybody's life by, you know, not taking enough care uh, regarding safety. So... Um, this is uh, the, there's a sort of a worst case scenario here, which is called wireheading, when the agent not only can find loopholes, but can actually change the reward function that it gets. So this is called wireheading. This is uh, you know experiments on animals where um, they you know you you put a wire in their head, and uh, when they press a button, they they get pleasure, and they get addicted to this, um, and they might die. In fact. But, but uh, you know, uh, more concerning is think of lobbying when companies can change the reward they get by changing the laws. And, and that's happening, right? It's not like science fiction. So if you have a machine, which is like a company, right, that trying to optimize something like its profit under the constraints that you put it or under like some reward function that we give it, um, it might find ways to... Uh, get good rewards. For example, you know, it may deceive or manipulate us into giving good rewards. So just in reinforcement learning, human with human feedback uh, that is currently done in LLMs. Uh, and that's very dangerous. Okay, so going back to the different kinds of misalignment. So now that we understand the notion of misalignment, um, let me let me you know illustrate that there are like uh, at least three broad categories of misalignment. There's a uh, misalignment between human and society. So that's, you know, I've talked about that already. It's just, it's, that exists in a lot of our uh, um, society's uh, institutions are meant to kind of mitigate this. Uh, but in the case of AI, this could happen if AI is intentionally used to harm, uh, you know, maybe motivated by greed, politics, seeking power, hate, military objectives, uh, economic dominance, right? The second category of misalignment is between the human operator and the AI. So, so in that case, the 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 you know the humans or the corporation that is designing the AI doesn't mean to harm, but it's it's happening. So this is exactly what we got with bias and discrimination, political polarization, and so on. And finally, there's the problem of misalignment between AI and society. Uh, it's slightly different because uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, we're talking about the general values that we, you know, we hold important, like human rights uh, or simply the survival of humanity. Um, and we could have AI that are not aligned with those values. So this, these would be rogue AIs. Um, they could lead to disempowering of humanity. There's a lot that's being written about it. And of course, 
potentially risking our future altogether, which is what people call existential risk. Okay. Um, in, in the short term, one of the issues I think uh, governments need to deal with is how even before we get superhuman AI systems, these tools could be used to influence in, in a way that's dangerous. So to destabilize democracy, for example, with an army of trolls that are not, you know, with humans behind, but, but AI systems behind. And we also already see that uh, we have uh, LLMs that can master language pretty well. So maybe we're just a short step away from an application of these types of technologies that is targeted at influencing people like to change their opinion, to vote differently. Uh, I don't think we have sufficient understanding of how you know this could uh, unroll and, and how we could um, avoid it. Um, Okay, and, and of course we know that humans are very influential. Uh, you know, think about conspiracy theories are simply political parties that are like cheating with the truth in one way or another in order to uh, influence. Um, so what if, uh, you know, we could, tr I mean, somebody trained an AI system to get even better than us at, at influencing and pressing our buttons in order to make us uh, believe something. The, the other uh, problem that is going to come gradually is power concentration. I talked already a lot about it. Um, fundamentally, uh, it's about the question, who decides what to do with the power of the technology that we are building? And as that power increases, it, this question becomes more and more important. And you have to realize that we already have in our society um, kind of uh, in a, you know in capitalism in the market system we we have rules that say it's okay to increase your economic power and in companies you know seek dominance economic dominance but we also know from from a theory of markets that actually if a company gets too dominant it's not good for for the markets and of course there's a danger that a very rich organization could use that power also to change the the rules that's that's lobbying and maybe influencing politics. So we know that's a problem. Um, so if we build very powerful AI systems, if somebody does that, how do we make sure that, uh, you know, what is done with that power is under democratic governance? Uh, this is a very, very important question. Um, as we approach superhuman AI, that, that means potentially extreme power concentration in the hands of just a few companies or a few people. Um, so this could also, uh, mean, you know, people wanting to use this to get more power, to dominate, not just economically, but politically squash opposition, or I think of countries trying to use this to dominate over the, the other countries. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, where this is going, this concentration of power is essentially authoritarian governments, uh, which is not safe for humanity and i'll have a slide about that okay now let's look at like the the, the biggie which is computers that might be smart enough so why would we even believe that it's possible to build machines that could be um smarter than us in, in in enough ways to be dangerous well so as i said like our brain is a machine this is like really the consensus in in, in biology um and computers have actually advantages over brains. They, they have, uh, in particular, paralyzation and communication bandwidth abilities that we've seen already deployed uh, uh, well above the capacities of humans. So although chat GPT isn't smarter than us in the sense that it's missing some things, we know that, uh, it can learn a lot faster and from more data because you can paralyze computation over a huge number of GPUs that each look at a bit of data and then share their weights in some way. And, um, you know, humans can't do that. Like, you know, we have a bottleneck of communication, which is language, just a few bits per second, whereas uh, machines can communicate like, you know, gigabits um, per second. Uh, so, so if we don't even discover principles of intelligence beyond the ones exploited in our brains, just because we have digital computers that have all these abilities, um, very likely they will be smarter than us. Like they will know more stuff. They will have better memory. Um, they will be able to act faster and all of these things. Um, 
So, so you know, what happens when we get uh, machines that are that powerful? I mean, one problem is anybody that has access to the you know these codes and and uh, the compute they need, which at runtime isn't that great, um, could potentially harm others. So the, the it, it's it's like if we gave to everyone access to very powerful weapons. Um, it's hard to get your hands on nuclear material. It's it's actually very cumbersome to manipulate, um, but it's very easy to get access to computers. Okay. Um, so in um, the testimony I gave to the U.S. Senate uh, a month ago, uh, I tried to think of uh, and explain what I see are levers on which society can play in order to minimize the risks for harm and and so those levers have to do the re, with all the required ingredients for harm coming from ai so one lever is access like how many people can tinker with a uh, powerful technology and you know misuse it and you know who are these people are they trustworthy and uh are they like licensed or do we know what they're doing and so on so this is an access uh uh, angle. If nobody can have access to the technology, then there's no danger. It's really humans are going to do something stupid with those machines. It's, you know, they're not spontaneously going to become um, self-preserving or something. Um, the other lever is uh, alignment, of course. Like if we can make those machines act as intended, then we can reduce the risks. Uh, but as as uh, I'll say later, even if we knew how to do that and we don't, uh, there's still the problem that. Um, if if you if you have the recipe for a, a very you know superhuman AI, you can also change its goals, and then and then you get something dangerous. So alignment is good because if you know people that have good intentions um, uh, are controlling these machines, then they can make them do you know useful stuff and not dangerous stuff. Um, the third lever is that uh, presumably, at least on the path that we are. AI systems that could be dangerous would need a lot of uh, compute power. They need to have a lot of data, and they need the right algorithms. So, just all of these are essentially the what people call the capability, like the problem-solving ability. Given some goal, how do you solve it? How do you achieve it? So that's raw intellectual power. So, anything that can control these aspects. So, for example, compute power, um, um, or you know, not sharing all of the best algorithms with everyone. Um, that can reduce the risks. Finally, the last lever is the scope of action. The you know even if there was a very intelligent AI, if it can't act in the world, then it's it's safe yeah, until it does. Um, but but you know when we design an AI system, we can make sure that we limit its um, its uh, action uh, scope of action. So for example, maybe it doesn't have access to the internet by itself. Um, okay, so. You can see that I'm worried, um, and I've had had a lot of discussions in the last uh, six months, um, including with people who uh, disagreed and and thought, you know, I didn't need to worry. And so they gave me a lot of arguments, and I've thought carefully about all of them because I really would like to be convinced that we we can just continue happily as before, designing technology that's you know more and more powerful. Uh, but I haven't found any argument that that would, you know, uh, make me uh, stop wearing. So I actually wrote wrote a wrote a blog post that lists over twenty five of these arguments. But I, I give give you a taste of that here. So one of the arguments, uh, you know, people tell me, Yash, well, don't worry, humanity has always benefited from technology. Well, we that may be true. Well, not actually, not exactly. Uh, Technology has also been misused, but but really we don't have experience with superhuman uh, technology, and uh, we also know that uh, when uh, you have uh, big uh, differences in power between different biological biological species, well, sometimes the the less powerful ones go extinct. We have driven you know over a thousand species to extinction in the last few years, for example. Um, second argument. Don't worry, Yoshua, because humans will design it so they can control it. 
yeah, actually, over 10 years of research in reinforcement learning and AI safety suggests that we don't yet know how to build a actually safe system. And uh, another like related argument is, oh, don't worry if it is not safe, we, we will not build it. But okay, so that maybe maybe the person telling me that, like Yann Le Quint, uh, will not build it, but not everyone has the right moral compass. And yeah, yes, we should not build it, but but uh, unfortunately, there's going to be a small proportion of humans with uh, who don't have the highest ethics or understanding of the consequences of their actions. Um, another uh, argument is, oh, don't worry, Joshua, because computers only work in the virtual world. Well, unfortunately, our society is is now very uh, heavily digitized, and there are a lot of things that you could do purely in the virtual world and still create a lot of harm. In addition, humans can be paid, or they can be influenced, as I said earlier. You know, you can pay people on the dark web, uh, and uh, you know, criminal organizations, and they will just do whatever you ask if uh, if you pay them. And then, you know, there's nothing to say that within a decade or so we will not solve robotics or maybe ai will help us solve robotics so then you know, machines will have um uh, a, a way to uh act directly in the world um and then another argument uh, that i think is really interesting is uh don't worry because good safe ais will save us from rogue AIs. well maybe but i think this is you know uh i think it's worth like trying to design good safe ais in good hands in order to protect us from potentially rogue AIs that could emerge. Uh, but but we shouldn't take it lightly because maybe the attacker could have the advantage. Uh, think about bioweapons and cybersecurity. Um, so as I said, uh, one issue uh, that is concerning is we don't know enough about how to build AI systems that are safe. In, after a decade of research on this question, uh, we still don't have uh, a demonstrably uh, controllable, aligned, uh, fair, and you know, safe way of building AI systems. Um, so, you know, what some people are saying, and I think there, there's kind of it's worth thinking about, is maybe we should like slow down. We should maybe even ban more powerful AI systems until we figure this out. That was the purpose of the letter assigned at the end of March. Um, but for sure, we should really strictly regulate the more powerful AI systems to reduce those risks. And, and for sure, we should invest massively in the socio-technical research, so AI, but also social sciences, political science, uh, law, and so on, to, uh, to mitigate those risks and to better understand the scenarios that could be dangerous. So what kind of scenario uh, could give rise to uh, disempowerment or existential risk? Um, once super AI systems are available to many people, well, the first scenario is somebody, you know, is crazy or something and uh, is genocidal and uses those tools to kill a lot of people or even all of humanity. Some people are desperate and, you know, all kinds of things. So it doesn't make sense to me to make superhuman AI capabilities available to everyone. The second uh, problem is that even if we don't intend it, um, somebody could lose control. Uh, as I said, it would be enough that an AI system has a self-preservation objective um, to create a conflict between humanity and, 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 and these AI systems. And you know, somebody could do it just because they find it cool, like, oh, I'm going to put a self-preservation goal in my AI because it's going to be like me, like humans, like other animals, but but that would be a terrible mistake. Once you have that, well, the machine doesn't want to be turned off. And if somebody wants to turn it off, then they will try to avoid it. They will try to escape it. They will try to copy themselves, uh, you know, like, like a computer virus to avoid being turned off or deleted. Um, they will try to manipulate us so that we won't do it. Um, and then there are uh, hard to understand arguments, but but I think are worth studying better that even if we don't explicitly ask a machine to have a self-preservation as one of its objectives, um, this may emerge as a side effect of other goals. And, and one way to think about this is if um, if I you know ask you to do a, a task, 
in order to be successful, you need to survive till the end of the task. So, so self-preservation emerges and, and also other goals like seeking power, like the, the, the more powerful you are, the smarter you are, the, you know, the better the reward you will get, the, the more you will, uh, the faster you will achieve your, 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 your goal. Um, then there are also arguments about uh, even if we solve the safety problem and we solve the power concentration problem, we may still lose um, as we might move towards a society where AI ends up doing everything and we humans are disempowered and at some point we're completely dependent on AI. Um, okay. Um, let me move on. So. There's a lot we don't know. Like, I'm not saying these scenarios are going to happen. Nobody really knows. And that's the problem. Like, there's so much uncertainty and the stakes are so high that I think ignoring them, denying them is, is, is uh, careless and dangerous. Um, even a small risk at that level is unacceptable. Um, so... Uh, I think we need to have the humility to say, well, we're not sure, we don't know what may happen, but we see possible scenarios that we can't rule out that create huge uh, negative outcomes. Now, the good news is we're not there yet, that you know, we're still in control. Human T is still in control. We are on a bad slope because with our current economic and political system, we're just going there happily and racing towards more powerful AI systems that are not properly, uh, you know, guardrailed. Um, so uh, it doesn't mean that everything in AI needs to stop. For example, uh, specialized AI systems that are only knowledgeable about uh, one aspect of knowledge. For example, say medical diagnostic. Um, that doesn't they, that, that might not know how to influence humans, for example. Um, they, they are much less dangerous. They don't know how society works, but they might know how to cure a particular disease. Um, on the other hand, when we have large-scale deployment, which is already happening, and uh, m very capable AI that know a lot of stuff, I think this is where we need much more regulation. Um, and until we know better, which probably might be forever, we we want to make sure that humans are in the loop, that we leave. Um, important decisions, uh, especially when they involve uh, morality in human hands. Um, we need to develop regulation in countries where AI is developed, but also where AI is deployed. Uh, if, that means all over the world to cover all the anticipated risks and harm. So from bias and discrimination and privacy and disinformation issues that are already happening to weaponization that may come very quickly, uh, with like cyber attacks and 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 other kinds of uh, you know biological or chemical weapons, uh, the concern of loss of control and the problem of power concentration in in a few hands. Um, one um, element to keep in mind when we think about all this is that we it's it's essentially impossible to disentangle AI capability from um, the goals that this uh, uh, intelligence is put to use, right? So, you know, in reinforcement learning, we can do goal condition agents, guilt goal condition policies. Uh, if you think about, uh, you know, chat GPT, you can, you can change the query. So even if we knew how to build a safe AI system, someone could instruct it with malicious goals or instruct it to preserve itself and we would all lose. Um, and so because it would be so easy if anyone had access, I think until we know better, um, we, we, we have to compromise some of our other values, like open source and open science. Uh, I think that some knowledge that's too dangerous until we know how to protect us from it should not be shared. Uh, that includes, I think, sharing future very powerful uh, LLMs that that um, could could be used uh, in in as a weapon uh, to, for example, design weapons more easily uh, by helping somebody who wouldn't know how to do it. Um, and so, I think open science and open source have served as well, and they continue to be important for almost everything. But when you design something that could be extremely harmful, 
um, extremely dangerous. I think we need to question that and have something like ethics review to decide, you know, what what should be shared and what should not be shared. So that's one of the recommendations I made uh, to the U.S. Senate. I think we should uh, move towards um, a society. Uh, I mean, academia and 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 companies research research where not just biology and medicine have ethics review, but but also AI research. And we need experts um, that manipulate these things to to have the proper ethical training. Um, uh, they, they we need to know who is operating these systems. They need to be in the, uh, licensed, both the individuals and the organizations. So think about like airplanes. The, the pilots are licensed, the uh, airplane company is licensed. And, and those organizations and people uh, have protocols that they have to follow in order to preserve the safety of, of the people they're carrying. Um, and they need to document what they're doing. Just same thing should happen with AI. Yeah, they should uh, be uh, external independent audits to make sure that actually they're doing the right things in terms of protecting the public. Um, and uh, and we need to make sure uh, that it's not easy for anyone to just go and not be registered uh, and and build very powerful and dangerous AI systems. For example, by controlling the access to uh, large computing resources. So I already talked about uh, the access to source code and train large models. I think this actually has been useful up to now. Like maybe Lama two is actually a good thing because it uh, allows more people to uh, study uh, potentially how to make them safer, but there is a threshold of dangerousness where I think it becomes uh, bad. Um, and, uh, and, and in general, if we're not sure that a system is safe enough, then we just, just ban it. Like you're not allowed to just construct an airplane that is unsafe and, and deploy it. Um, same thing for AI. Um, uh, the idea of a liability regime is something also important because uh, government regulations can't anticipate every possible you know, bad outcome. But if you make companies and individuals liable, if what they do uh, you know, creates harm, um, both uh, financially and, and criminally for individuals, then I think uh, companies and individuals will have a greater incentive to act in a safe way. Um, an example of um, sort of shorter term thing we should do, I think, is make the counterfeiting of humans a criminal offense, just like counterfeiting of money is a criminal offense. So what, what do I mean? Uh, we don't want uh, deep fakes and uh, the uh, dialogue systems to be used to pretend uh, that a human in general or a particular human is speaking or acting or saying things or interacting with someone else. Because, well, you could see how this could destroy, you know, could be used for fraud and could be also destroying democracy um, if if uh, these things are used. It's already, people are already starting to do that, uh, to uh, come up with, um, say, convincing videos or even worse, interactive systems uh, with images and sounds and texts that... Um, that pretend uh, that that have the appearance of of someone that could be influential, or it could be someone in your uh, you know in your family even. Um, and one of the aspects of this is who has access to the collective discussions we're having, in particular on social media. Right now, it's very easy to open an account without being actually a human, and because we you know it could be automated. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of work in the social media company to try to find uh, improper accounts and, and, and delete them. But, but I think uh, a stronger protection would be that all these social media accounts are actually verified to be associated with a human. And that verification is done by a human. Um, and, and there are issues with that if you think about the non-democratic countries, but I think they can be handled technically. Um, we also need to work on the international level because, well, uh, as I said, AI could be used to destabilize the world order, um, at least, you know, peace. Um, uh, for example, it could be used uh, to design weapons and especially kind of 
frightening are lethal autonomous weapons, where the AI itself decides to kill without having a human in the loop. And uh, so we need to have international treaties uh, to ban that. People have been discussing this for over a decade. It's time to actually sign those treaties. Uh, there's been, of course, resistance by countries like the US and, and Russia and China. Um, but uh, as the AIs become more powerful, there's a danger that um, if some of their actions include killing and killing massively, if it's like nuclear weapons, uh, like this is this is this is a very, very dangerous scenario. Like if we lose control of an AI system that can kill a lot, um, uh, or you know, under the control of a human, uh, somebody takes control of uh, nuclear weapons, either way, uh, thanks to AI, uh, that that would be disastrous. Um, so I think there are already enough incentives for democracies to regulate against um, uh, some of the misuses of AI, like uh, to uh, you know AI demagogues, as I call them, national security threats, uh, extreme power concentration. I, I, no country wants these things to happen on their soil. Um, so that can go on uh, bef before we reach international agreements. But international agreements are necessary to reduce the worldwide risks. So. Uh, some of the attacks uh, on national security, like with uh, computer viruses or with um, biological viruses, could start from a different country. And 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 viruses, these viruses don't know any border. Um, somebody could lose control of an AI in a different country, and then the AI, you know, can just use the internet to go anywhere it wants. Um, so, so I think we should also think about what would be the incentive for developing countries that don't have AI power to sign these agreements. Um, and, you know, besides besides the goodness of their heart, because they don't want humanity to be harmed. Um, I think uh, rich countries should think of uh, uh, incentives that are economic as well, like like market access, uh, and also making the AI benefit humanity, like address uh, the sustainable development goals uh, and not just maximize profit. Um, so, so the other reason we need international agreements is to share in research and protocols to manage all the AI risks from discrimination, privacy to disinformation and loss of control, and to make sure that the power that is being created by AI is not concentrated in a single country because that's that's like a single point of failure. If if that country becomes authoritarian, for example, um, we need the very very powerful AI systems to exist in multiple countries in in multiple organizations to avoid that single point of failure. Um, the other kind of question that's interesting is like thinking long term. Uh, how could we survive as a society if there are these superhuman AI systems that are out there in a sustainable way? Uh, so, for example, Nick Bostrom suggested uh, authoritarian regimes that would control everyone, like, you know, Big Brother with uh, us having a camera around our neck. Um, I actually don't think that's a good, re a good solution. I mean, besides the fact that it would destroy human rights and democracy, um, I don't think it's a good solution because authoritarian regime are lacking the checks and balances to take wise and safe decisions about AI and humanity. Um, so uh, yeah, so basically there are two reasons why we don't want centralized power, as I said already. I mean, this is endangering democracy and even markets, and it's um, uh, it, it's not safe, like uh, you know, because of the single point of failure problem and. The fact that authoritarian governments will be focused on preserving their power rather than preserving humanity. So, how do we design society, you know, in coming decades, to reduce the chances of things like that happening? Um, well, we want to regulate, of course, but also we want to avoid sources of injustice that could lead some people or some organizations to choose violence as a way to solve their problem. Uh, that means getting rid of wars. I mean, inequity, you know, it's a big program, but, but long-term, I think this is the only solution. Um, I want to say a few words about uh, some personal and psychological uh, factors at play here. Uh, you know, I, I really 
became worried about all this uh, only in 2023, at the beginning of the year. Uh, and it took me several months to really come to grips with this. Um, I used to brush away uh, these kinds of potentially horrific concerns with reassuring arguments that I was telling myself or you know, buying from other people, um, mostly based on the idea that superhuman AI would be something very far into the future. And so in the meantime, we could do good with AI. But um, but the progress, the acceleration of progress we've seen uh, questions, uh, you know, I think I don't think I was completely honest with myself uh, brushing these concerns away. And it's it. And the reason is it's difficult to accept that the work you're doing may be bringing major harms. Uh, you'd like to think of yourself as someone you good. Um, also, it's it's hard to admit that you were wrong and and. Uh, but, but actually, you know, being a good scientist means having humility, acknowledging that we make mistakes, acknowledging that there is uncertainty, that you know, actually we don't have the solution. Uh, and instead, like, listen to everyone and aggregate all the reasonable views that are compatible with the data. Um, also, for some people, it's difficult to think about this because there's so much uncertainty. Like, we, we, but, but when we have to take decisions, like regulation, for example, um, well, we have to decide in spite of uncertainty. And, and so having really a everyone with expertise around the table and all the stakeholders around the table and public deliberations is, I think, the way to go. Um, but we can't just say, oh, let's forget about it. It's too uncertain because it might be too late if we wait until catastrophes happen. All right. In... Uh, Maybe the last few minutes, I want to say that I'm also thinking about how we could build AI systems that would be safe or at least safer. Um, and one simple idea that's been around for a while is uh, if the AI has no agency, cannot act in the world, and I mentioned that already, um, then uh, it would be safe or safer. Um, so, well, can we build AI systems that don't act in the world? Well, yeah. Think of, I call this an AI scientist. So imagine an AI system that is only trying to understand how the world works and helping our human scientists solve problems, solve scientific problems that matter to humanity, you know, uh, like, like pandemics and, and climate change. Um, so, so that would be hugely useful, but we don't need to uh, create AI systems that act in the world. I mean, agents, uh, AI agents could be also very useful, but, but, they're not safe right now. We don't know how to control them. But if we build such an AI scientist, I think, uh, at least I have a very strong conjecture that there's no risk of loss of control. Um, um, but of course, it could still fall in the wrong hands. And so we also have to deal, we still have to deal with that. Um, and as part of thinking about how we could build um, AI systems that would be good scientists and would not propose solutions that could harm us. Uh, I think it's good to think about the way we're currently training them uh, based on maximum likelihood. Uh, what happened with the way we train these systems now, and you know, almost every uh, AI system and deep learning system, um, is that uh, they could be wrong with high confidence in some places. This is what you know people call it hallucinations with LLMs. And when you do that with reinforcement learning, it's even worse. And the reason is um, the policy uh, can discover the places where the model's understanding of the world is, is wrong. And uh, maybe you know the model thinks that there is some treasure somewhere, like some high reward. But in fact, it could be a very dangerous action. And, and because in RL, we optimize policies, we optimize choices of actions, uh, even if very few actions uh, can can be like this, like they, they look good, but they're harmful. Um, uh, you know, the, the optimization that happens when we train the RL system is going to um, be more likely to discover such dangerous scenarios. So, so where I think we should go, and we don't know how to do it efficiently right now, is AI systems that are Bayesian and, and that are like strongly Bayesian. Um, one way to see why Bayesian is safer is think about an agent, uh, my little scenario here, um, that is in front of two doors. And based on the data that I've seen before, it has two theories. Um, under one theory, 
And, and let's say that one of these two theories is actually correct. And the one theory, the one on the left, the left door, you know, uh, you die or you create some big harm. Uh, and the right door, you get some high reward, cake. The other theory says on the left door, you get the uh, cake. And on the right uh, door, nothing good, nothing bad happens. So the thing with maximum likelihood, if you have multiple theories that are compatible with the data, is that it it could choose any of these theories, just like chance. And of course, if it picks the wrong theory, then uh, you're going to die. Uh, I mean, if the right theory is the right one and it picks the, the, the left one, uh, you're going to die, right? Um, whereas the Bayesian agent would sort of take a decision, taking into account that there are many theories that are compatible with the data. And so it would say, well, you know, there's 50% probability for each of these theories, let's say, so the right action, the you know, the safe action here is take the right door because you know maybe I get cake, maybe you know nothing bad, nothing good. Whereas on the left side, I could really um, uh, be in for it. Um, so um, in the context of AI safety, I, I think um, this is important because um, it, it's connected to the problem of alignment. Remember, the alignment problem is. The AI doesn't really know what our true intentions are. They, they don't understand our internal preferences, our internal moral compass. We may give them a bit of information. That's the contract. You know, we give a query, um, you know, like clothes constitution. So we may try and, you know, we should, but there's going to be a mismatch. So one solution proposed by Stuart Russell and his collaborators is that um, we consider the AI considers the, the human preferences as latent variables. What does that mean? It means it never it's never sure of what will cause harm. Um, and so the AI will maintain ideally a Bayesian uncertainty on, on these human preferences. The AI also knows that uh, humans will tend to make their choices according to those preferences. So, we you know, we, we usually do, we do we usually avoid harm. And so if the AI has such a model, including potentially one that doesn't know much, at least it's going to avoid actions that according to its model of human preferences, uh, which has uncertainty will avoid potential harm, and the more it learns about our preferences, you know, the 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 it, it's not going to need to be as conservative. But even if it does know very little, uh, then what's going to happen is it's going to prefer to do nothing. It's going to defer to humans because it knows that humans, you know, know their own preferences better than the AI, and so you know, let the humans act. So this is sort of automatic safety thing, if we can be Bayesian, that comes up. Okay, I'll stop here. Um, thank you for your attention and taking the time to digest what I've been talking about. It's going to take more than a lecture to really uh, make sense of all this um, and encourage you to read a lot more and to think about it too. Thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, it's clear that you uh, put a lot of thought into this. And uh, I really appreciate that because I feel, think as a scientist, it's uh, it's easy to get excited by new technologies, just uh, jump into it, um, while it's much harder to uh, admit that we also have a responsibility and, uh, and try to think a bit more about it. Exactly. I should have a lot of questions. Um, I just want to ask, please try to keep them short because I'm pretty sure there will be, there will be many. Um, yeah. Let's start. Yep. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bengio, for your talk. Um, so uh, in one of your slides, you had talked about adding in um, a reg piece of regulation where you would limit the access to powerful AI models. Um, yes. And the basis for a lot of the risks that you're talking about is predicting really bad things happening over a really long period of time. But humans have been quite bad at predicting even near-term things. Like we can't predict specific aspects of the climate even a right. week from now. So given that we're not good at predicting that, do you think that adding um, 
closed access aspects to um, regulation and not allowing uh, research like all the researchers to um, access powerful AI models would be a good decision, even in terms of safety. It's it's precisely because we're not sure, and because the stakes are high, so the danger is high. So, I I don't have a crystal ball, but no one else does. However, with what we know, you could say that we don't have any like convincing reason to think that a lot of these dangerous scenarios couldn't happen. In fact, it's just logical if you think about it. Forget about AI, just technology gets more powerful and it's dual use. Uh, somebody will do something bad with it. And we already have lots of regulation to control access to dangerous chemicals, dangerous like biological material, like viruses, uh, dangerous uh, nuclear material. Like we already do that. We control access when a technology is potentially very dangerous. It is just the logical thing to do. Uh, in the case of AI, I agree with you that we, we uh, you know, there is so much we don't know. And it's not just AI, by the way, it's society. Like how do, how will people and company react in different scenarios? How will governments react and so on? There's so much uncertainty, but it is precisely because we don't know that we have to be on the safe side. And I'm not saying that uh, we shouldn't do any research on, on these AI systems, but we should do it very carefully. And I don't think that the current way of doing it with a few companies controlling everything is safe either because they have commercial interests. Um, I think that kind of power that is gradually being built should be under democratic governance. In other words, the people decides, the people decide collectively uh, what we do with that power. Um, so uh, we we restrict access to you know who's allowed to drive a passenger jet because there's the safety of 200 people on the plane. But right now there's no such kind of licensing or registration that's needed when you build computer systems that could be extremely dangerous. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe, sorry, just one organizational detail. Let's take questions from this side of the audience for a while so we can use the camera on that side and then we switch. Our speaker. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joshua. Um, this is Shannon Valor. I just have a question uh, about the superhuman AI framing. So yes. I think 90% of what you're saying is 100% right, but I want to get your response to the challenge that the superhuman AI framing actually increases the risks that you're talking about. It's so, not about framing. It's it's that it's likely we're going to get there. Okay. I'm going to challenge that. So I just want to know what- How do you know? Well, let me let me explain. So you're equating intelligence and intellectual power with problem solving ability, and then suggesting that AI systems can be superhuman just by being faster problem solvers. But I'd argue that this definition of intelligence is losing the most important dimensions of human intelligence and capability, things like moral intelligence and practical wisdom, including those virtues like humility and honesty and self-critique that you mentioned. Those aren't problem-solving capacities, but they're essential for human They are. They are problem-solving capacities. I, I don't think so. Not in the narrow sense. What do you mean? You, you don't think that your brain is a machine? And that evolution is not has the kind of machine that we're so that talking about with AI. There's, no, there's there's no there's no obvious parallels between the kinds of biological elements that drive our moral responses and the kinds of systems that we're building today with AI. So just let how me get. Could you be so sure? How could you be so sure? Okay, well, I let, mean, let your me... brain is a machine, so there are principles behind it, and we are on the path to figure them out. It's just a matter of time. It's a kind of machine, but it's not the kind of machine that we're building. Why with would why would a, a machine that works on silicon not be able to perform any of the computations that our brain does? No, it's not about capacity in theory. It's about what we're actually building. We're not. No, but I'm talking about the future. I'm talking okay, about where we are going. I understand that. But where we're going is nowhere near machines that have humility. 
nowhere near machines that have empathy. Um, so I, what I'm trying to say is I this. wish they had actually, actually, if they had these things, we would be sure that off. would be great. That would be but great. The problem, no the, problem, idea. the problem is you could have machines that are dangerous, even if they don't have empathy. Absolutely. That I agree 100%, but that's not so, my point. That's your, let me make the point and then you, you, you might have something else to say in response to it. Okay. So I think the superhuman AI framing implies that intelligent humans are nothing more than optimizers and problem solving machines. And then if we accept that AI systems are superhuman, then why not surrender human agency and power to the machines? What more do we have to offer, right? You've already said that they're better than we are at everything that is involved or entailed in being human. And I'm saying that that framing leaves out everything about human intelligence that's actually worth saving. And the description okay, I, of AIs I, I, as superhuman I, is unintentionally, I think, encouraging a loss of confidence in human wisdom and human worth, mm -hmm. which is exactly what we need to hold on to if we're trying to avoid any of the grave okay. harms that you're talking about. So, so here's the thing I think that you should keep in mind. Intelligence is not like a linear, like one dimensional thing. Exactly. No, uh, it's you could have, concept. you could have machines that are, um, uh, smarter than us in some ways and dumb in some ways. Absolutely. And, you know, so long as they're smart in ways that give them power over us, they are dangerous. And, um, you know, imagine like aliens in another planet, just Think about the intelligence of other like uh, smart mammals on this planet. They don't have the same exact kind of intelligence and emotional uh, intelligence that we have. That's right. right, and that's why we don't call them superhuman, even if we well, okay. discovered. Okay. Okay. What I mean by superhuman is simply that they surpass us in ways that could be dangerous for us. That's it. But that suggests sorry, that to sorry, be sorry, human. Sorry. I think I have yeah, to cut this. Of first. course, but that suggests that to be human is simply to be dangerous. No, no. I disagree. I mean, if you have a better word to suggest, fine. But for now, that's the one that I find more appropriate. I'm happy to change if you suggest a better word. Thank you both. <laughs> uh, thank you, Joshua, for the very insightful presentation. Uh, one quick question that might have some, you know, more uh, uh, heavy implications. My question is like when we try to verify that like a uh, an intelligent agent, uh, artificial or human, has uh, is aligned towards some properties, there is this concept yes. of outer alignment and inner alignment. So my intuition right now would be that we cannot prove inner alignment, like so much as much as we might try to prove that it conforms to certain behavior standards and ethics. Uh, yeah. This agent might, let's say, deceive us might show externally some behavior that is uh, follows some formal specification, but the actual right. specification is different. So right. what is your intuition in that regard? Could we achieve inner alignment or what would be a path towards exploring that? Well, that's exactly why we need a lot more research in um, understanding the alignment problem. Um, I don't think anybody has the answer to your question. And that's what, what concerns me is that we're still racing ahead with gradually more and more powerful systems. And the companies that are doing it say that they, you know, they care about safety, but I'm, I'm not, I, yeah, I'm not reassured, uh, cause we don't know the details of what they're doing and they're like going full speed with, the the intention to be the first ones, uh, to kind of, you know, win or something. That's not reassuring for me. Um, we need to massively invest in a way that's like publicly funded in uh, designing systems that are going to be safe in all the ways and aligned morally. Uh, we don't know how to do it. And um, like, if you ask me if it is possible one day, um, I don't know. Um, but Really, there are so many benefits if we can make progress with AI that is safe and not without, you know, and avoiding the power concentration problem, uh, that it's worth if it's worth doing that research. Um, yeah. So there are th simple things, as I said in my presentation, if we get rid of the agency part, that increases safety quite a lot. The only non-safe part comes if the system gets in the hand of somebody 
which was, wants to use it for uh, malicious purposes. Thank you. Uh, let's take a last one from this side and then move there. Uh, hey, Yosha. Um, I think the chance that AI wipes out humanity is going to be non-zero in a number of years. Uh, and uh, the chance of it happening in any given year is going to be non-zero. So it seems like in the long term, it's very likely to happen, even if it's in 100 or in 100 million years. What do you think about that? I've thought a lot about this. I don't know the answer. It looks like what you say. I agree. This is sort of a reasonable projection to make. Um, but but it, in part, it's because we don't know how to make systems safe. And we don't know if it's possible. And we don't know how to make society safe in the sense that uh, we make sure that you know someone somewhere is not going to abuse the power that may be available. Um, we don't know if there are like social solutions to this, like forms of organization that would protect us. Um, my feeling is the way humans are now is not going to be sustainable. Um, so like we need to get rid of a lot of human problems. Uh, think about education is already, you know, and, and health and, and, uh, material well-being is already a good step in that direction. Um, but I don't know. Um, one of the ideas that uh, is floating around is as we make progress towards smarter AI systems, they might help us if, if we keep them safe, uh, they might help us design safer AI systems and uh, even uh, you know uh, sustainable societies. But <laughs> these are like Hail Mary kind of solutions. Thank you. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about the the uh, AI uh, scientist kind of idea where it's like yeah. you remove the, the agency and you give it a limited action space and that can yes. potentially make things safer. Um, yeah, I just want to hear like how like realistic do you think it is to implement that setting? Because obviously, um, yeah, if, if like the, the sci AI scientist tells you uh, here's a plan. Here's what. Here's the goal, and here's the plan. How, here's how to execute it. Um, but like, but then the humans have to execute it. That's like a big bottleneck, and a, potentially we can, if we allow the AI to do it, we could achieve it much quicker. So there's obviously like yes. Yeah, so there will benefits. be, if you don't have any governance, then there will be an incentive say, for companies to forget about the agency constraint, and forget about humans in the loop because they'll make more money by allowing the AI to do things directly. So, so that's why we need governance. Until yeah, so. we know better, I think we, we should not let AI systems do whatever they want in the world. Uh, it's crazy. OK, so yeah, it's like a, a governance problem, really. It is. It is, exactly. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, so I am uh, a PhD in economics, uh, particularly studying deep learning and causal difference. So I was super excited when I heard that you were referring to causality and in particular contract theory, principal agent problems and all that. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about uh, literature and authors who are working on this and how they're approaching it. And more in particular, I, when I've been looking at both problems, principal agent and uh, AGI and AI safety, I was always worried about all those impossibility theorems, like Arrow's impossibility theorem, that are theorems that basically say there's nothing to align, align to mathematically. Like it's actually mathematically impossible to define a social preference or something like that. So, but yeah, more interested in who is working on this and how are they approaching okay, it. Okay, so, so the one person I would suggest you to read is Dylan Hatfield Menel. Uh, I'll uh, paste his name in the chat. Um, and he knows a lot about the economics literature. Um, and he, um, he's been writing precisely on the relationship between AI alignment and the uh, principal agent contract uh, challenge. 
Um, he has several papers on this. I mean, and there are other co-authors. Uh, Stuart Russell was on one of the important papers uh, he worked on as well. Uh, but Dylan really focused on this. Uh, he's at MIT. Um, Yeah, and and whether there is a solution or not, like as I said earlier, like I don't know. And because this is such an important stake, um, we should we should invest a lot more, or and or we should slow down, you know, careless progress. That's dangerous. Uh, hello, and thank you for your very nice presentation. Uh, to make the connection with. Uh, the first question, I think, it was mentioned in the answer that we have managed to control uh, after, uh, nuclear weapons, for example, as a community somehow. To some extent. To some extent. That's from fear of retaliation, because if one side yes, uses it, yes, the other yes. will also as well. But this doesn't apply exactly here, right? In the sense that uh... it takes only one scientist maybe to make a super general AI for it to escape the world or whatever. So I'm not sure how easy it is to actually constrain some sense uh, to make the connection maybe with a popular Oppenheimer movie how close are we from our mini atomic disaster hopefully mini I hope far although if it's mini maybe it's going to increase awareness and politicians will start moving faster um so I think there is an incentive for countries like say China and the US to sit down around the table and agree on uh, governance uh, protocols for AI safety. And the incentive is that both countries, in fact, every country, but they, they have like more um, uh, power in AI, both countries uh, would lose if uh, any of them uh, ended up, uh, you know, uh, allowing a, a, a rogue AI to emerge. So it's like, it's not the retaliation problem, although that could be part of it because it's AI could also be used just as a weapon controlled by humans, but it's also, whoa, whoa, we may all lose if we don't all follow some kind of governance and protocols for safety. So I think there will be an incentive for them to sit down. The incentive will be stronger if they understand the risks which is going to take some time, but I see I see the US government is starting to come to some understanding of that. I see the UK government is, is making progress in that direction. Um, I don't know about the Chinese government, but but I suspect they're like looking into this. Hopefully uh, that moves us in the right direction. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one last question. I'm, I'm, and... um, Francesco, I'm happy to stay a few more minutes. Oh, okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Then we can have a few more. But um, anyway, what I wanted to ask is, uh, um, I feel the questions uh, from the audience were only from uh, uh, male attendees. It would be nice if we also had uh, some of the rest of the uh, audience uh, to ask a question, if you have one. Of course, don't feel pressured, but it would be just nice. Um, maybe while well, people are thinking about their question, uh, I'd like to go back to the disagreement I had with the lady I couldn't hear her name <laughs> or see her. Because um, there's something important that she said that that um, I think deserves attention, which is um, we should be careful in the stories we tell ourselves uh, about these concerns uh not to lose track of you know uh humanity as a goal and preserving humanity as a goal um i certainly like value humanity uh, a lot i don't think that raw intelligence is the ultimate thing that we should be seeking um and uh that's that's shared by a lot of humans i think you know that's basically what the humanist values are about um, it's not clear that other intelligences, which may be smarter than us in many ways, would share the same kind of uh, values that humans have, um, uh, empathy and solidarity with each other. Um, and I agree, this is very important and, and worth fighting for, um, but, but we shouldn't just hide the danger um, 
that there could be machines that are stronger than us intellectually, at least um, in, in ways that uh, could be dangerous for our survival, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I, I agree 100% on, on the risk. All I'm challenging is just the superhuman framing because I think we're forgetting about the aspects of being human that uh -huh. aren't replicated in these machines. I they agree. Are exactly the dimensions that we care most about saving for yes. our own sake and for the sake of uh, the future of the species. So I just want to avoid the comparison by which the only metrics that we mm -hmm. measure our own being on are those that we share with these machines. I see what you mean. I agree. Um, um, let's try to find better language, uh, but I agree. Thanks. I'll try to think of something. I don't have anything yet. I love that you came to an agreement. <laughs> um, any more questions? Nice. Hi. Um, so we were talking about safety and agents before. I wanted to ask if you would suggest to proactively um, prevent the cooperation between AI and like robotics, for example, Boston Dynamics currently. Um, so like as a proactive step until we have figured it out. Totally. Um, well, the good news is we are far from having solved robotics. Um, so it gives us a bit of time where the agency of computers is limited to like harm in the virtual world or influencing humans, you know, through, through, through text or something or videos. Um, and then humans do the things that, that we should keep that in mind and monitor the progress in robotics to make sure it, you know, it doesn't end up being another source of risk when, uh, powerful AI systems can control these robots. So I, I, I wouldn't say that we should stop robotics research because there are lots of things that uh, not superhuman AI systems, but specialized AI systems could be useful for with improved robotics. I mean, it's not, they're already used in industry, but, but you know, people working in robotics have many applications in mind that could be useful for humanity in general. Um, uh, say in agriculture, for example, um, and uh, these systems that are like maybe helping to make um, food, um, you know, grow uh, with, without uh, chemicals, for example, um, could could be useful. And yet, no need for them to like know everything uh, in the internet, right? Hi, hi, Joshua. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so we, you spoke about causality a bit and yes. based your recent work in this field. Uh, do you think that causality and causal discovery uh, can be a, an avenue for more safe and more responsible yes. AI? Do you think it's, and do you think this research is uh, an opportunity for the research community? Yeah, I do. Um, but it's a, two-edged sword, right? So any research that increases capability in potentially significant ways, we have to be careful uh, what we're doing. But yes, uh, in particular, there are several reasons why causality could help safety. So I, I mentioned the AI scientists. So the AI scientists isn't actually trained to take optimal decisions, actions in the world, but rather to really focus on understanding, like what are good theories, uh, that explain things we see, for example, let's say climate problems. And when you build theories to explain data, you know, scientific data, um, well, having a causal model, I mean, a theory is basically a causal model. And so uh, having algorithms that could help us 
do a better job at helping our scientists solve, um, I mean, address help with uh, some of our you know biggest challenges in in health or the environment or education, for example. Um, that would clearly be useful. But we we also have to keep in mind the dual use aspect as we do this. Thank you very much. Anymore? Okay. Oh, there's another reason why causality could be useful. It could help with interpretability. So uh, the, th the theories that the machines could generate, if they are expressed in a causal language, they're more likely, I mean, in a causal language that's similar to our causal language, which has all kinds of properties like sparsity, um, then um, the understanding of the world that the machine has would be something that humans could make sense of could be expressed in words or you know in equations that humans understand. So there's that's another aspect of safety, which is we want to build systems that we have a, a better understanding of what they understand so that we know that they are not building you know dangerous or misguided knowledge that could be dangerous. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I would like to ask in light of your working on consciousness, okay, yes. Mm -hmm. And also other people working on the part of uh, cognition that we haven't managed to replicate yet. Um, if you would be pro the creation of true AGI, and if so, how would you imagine its emergence? Would it be a cooperated government effort? Would it be a lab effort? Okay, so first of all, going back to the discussion I had with uh, the lady with whom I disagreed initially, um, there are many sorts of intelligences that could be built. And I think it would be a huge mistake to try to build intelligences that are just like us in every way, like consciousness, for example. Um, there are several reasons for this. Uh, um, I think humans should remain the ones responsible. Um, I think that if we... Um, if we design AI systems that are like us, so basically they have a moral status, that means we are basically designing systems that have self-preservation and that's dangerous from a safety point of view, as I mentioned. Uh, I think it, also, it could also be very confusing for, from a point of view of how society works and is organized. Um, on the other hand, a lot of my research on consciousness was about understanding the um, what may be going on in our brain that could explain some of the properties of, you know, what we report as being conscious and what neuroscience has been studying for the last few decades since we can peer into brains. And I, I now suspect that the subjective experience uh, that we feel and we can talk about is something that has a mechanical interpretation and serves is a kind of side effect of serving a, a a learning and computational objective in terms of our ability to handle abstractions, for example. Um, but yeah, uh, I think I forgot a bit of your question. There was something else, I think. Uh, yeah, how would you imagine the emergence of? Oh AGI? yes, yes. Well, so I think I don't think we should build kind of general intelligences because we we we, we want to build tools that are going to help us. So, like the AI scientist is an example. Um, um, we don't want to build copies of us, or you know, worse. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, uh, and I think there was a part of the question about who's going to do it and um, writing a paper about it that should come up in a few weeks. Um, I think it should be done by a network of organizations that are trustworthy or nonprofit and non-governmental to avoid the power concentration problem and the, um, uh, you know, yeah, potential emergence by mistake of, of, um, of a rogue AI. 
Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question was that you suggested that these technologies should, the access to these technologies should be restricted some to some people. And yes. my question was, who should these people be and who decides yeah. who has access to this technology? Thank you. We, democracy. So the answer is we collectively decide who should be manipulating these systems. And we do it for all kinds of other things. I, I you know, I talked about uh, passenger jet pilots, but we, yeah. not everyone is allowed to do everything. So we need people who are trustworthy. We need to make sure they 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 have clear protocols about what to do um, with what they have in their hands. Uh, we need to make sure they their what they do is aligned with what society you know uh, values. Uh, they, that means representing the you know everyone on this planet. And not just a few uh, like commercial interests, for example. Um, that, that, that's that's it, maybe you think it's idealistic, but I think in this case, if we don't solve these problems, it's going to blow in our face. These okay. governance problems. Yeah. Yeah, governance. I guess. Okay. Thank you very much. And I don't mean governments should be doing it. It's it's a subtle. There's a subtle difference between governments and governance. Uh, because governance governments could also be subject to uh, concentration of power. You know, they want to win their next election, or they want to win against their some other country. Um, and so it has to be multilateral, like many democratic countries getting together and saying, "Okay, this is the safe way for for the you know sake of humanity and democracy to um, to organize this work." so that uh, it has the right governance and it can't lead to some entity taking control, whether it's a human, a country, a company or whatever, or an AI. Um, I think we can probably stop here. Uh, I know you are very busy. I remember how busy you were, I can imagine now. And uh, it's uh, uh, Saturday as well, so we don't want to take more of your time. But thank, thank you so much uh, also for taking a bit more uh, time for us. We, I'm pretty sure that I'm talking for the audience. Um, we really appreciated your, uh, you sharing your thoughts. And also, I think it, it will be um, good for thoughts uh, for us as well. And it will uh, probably create a lot of discussion during the break. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Have a good day.